Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that, that we, we have, have sinned, sinned against, against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Glory to God in the heart. with you and also with you let us pray mighty God the fountain of all wisdom you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask through the worthiness of your son Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
from the letter of Paul to the Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness within our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Another parable Jesus put before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. The good news of our Lord Jesus Christ in today's gospel applies to all the faithful, but it may be of particular interest to the children and youth who are assigned outdoor chores during these hot summer months. The good news is this. According to Jesus, you never have to pull weeds again. Sorry, moms and dads. I'm just calling it like I see it. We can all see just how shocking and maybe even frustrating this parable might be for those of us who want to eradicate the weeds in our yards and the enemies in our lives. We want them gone forever. We want them yanked out by the roots and destroyed. We all have a problem with weeds, and the problem is this. There is no precise definition of a weed. The definition of a weed is an unwanted plant. Now for a child, there is no more desirable plant than a dandelion. You can pick it by the stem, blow those little parachutes into the breeze and watch them land in the grass and see your parents become unhinged before your very eyes. I placed an artichoke plant in my garden for the first time this year. With long, jagged leaves, it looked like a noxious weed sprouting up between my tomato vines, but now I am enjoying the most delicate artichoke hearts dipped in melted butter. Two years ago, I took a shortcut when I was tired and not paying attention, pushing my lawnmower over some weeds intruding into a flower bed. I learned the unfortunate lesson that healthy strawberry plants don't come back if you chop them up with a mower. Weeds are in the eye of the beholder, and our eyesight is not always very discerning. So, Jesus says, just leave them alone for now. They're not your problem. 
Although we are hearing this parable from the middle of Matthew's gospel, it occurs near the beginning of Jesus' ministry with his new disciples. He is trying to explain this mysterious kingdom of God to his followers and how they fit into the wider picture of goodness and evil, of intervention and passivism, of doubt and trust. They didn't get it right away, just like we don't get it right away. Jesus recognizes that there is an enemy of goodness. God knows this without our help. And God knows who the enemy is and who the enemy's children are. We should take great comfort in our Lord's nonchalance about all of this. It is a sign that God sees a clear difference between an inconvenience and a real danger. You see, the enemy has no control whatsoever over the good seed, the children of the kingdom. The enemy is only able to sow deception and confusion. It's servants like us who seem most concerned about the weeds. The master knows that things are very much under control. A second point worth noting about this parable is that God does not need our help. I want to quickly add that there are plenty of other parables that teach all the ways in which God welcomes our help, but Jesus never suggests that God needs our help. The good news, of course, being that we worship a God who is not needy. I also want to add that even this parable does not say that resisting evil is wrong, only that it will not be as effective as God's final judgment about goodness and evil. I think the crux of the problem is what I named earlier. Our problem is the vagueness of how we define weeds as simply unwanted. So to the Third Reich, it meant six million Jews. To the Ottoman government, it meant one and a half million ethnic Armenians. To Stalin's government, it was seven million or more Ukrainian peasants. To the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, it was one and a half million of their opponents, political, military, journalists, students, doctors, lawyers, and regular people. To the government in Rwanda, it was a million Tutsis. To the ISIS regime, it was the Yazidi people and other heretics of their fundamentalist theology. To white lynching mobs in America, it was blacks who needed to be kept in their subjugated place. And even to Anglican Christians, it meant fellow Christians who were pushing too hard or too fast for unwanted reforms within the 16th century church. Do you see our problem? The very broad category of unwanted places millions and millions of people in danger of being eradicated. It also places millions and millions of people in danger of becoming eradicators, including Christian people like us. Nobody is safe on either side of the unwanted judgment. I am thankful for the insights of the Reverend Robert Capon about the parables of Jesus. Last year, our Thursday Bible study class, whom I desperately miss each week, we studied Capon's three-volume work on the parables, including this parable. Among other insights, we were blessed to learn how the early church would have heard this parable during worship retold in ancient Greek. They would have heard the verb aphete, 
leave the weeds alone. Permit the weeds to be. Let go of the weeds for now. And then the congregation would have prayed the way our Savior Jesus Christ taught us to pray, affess our debts as we affiamen our debtors. O oh God, please leave alone all of our debts to you as we promise to leave alone all the debts other people owe us. Lord, please let go of our trespasses against your goodness as we promise to let go of the trespasses of others. Lord, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. The real problem is that the weeds are just everywhere. And the unwanted thoughts, words, and deeds in our own spiritual backyards can be every bit as much of a problem as the unwanted thoughts, words, and deeds we see in other people's yards. In order not to lose sight of the greater good, the good seed, the abundant harvest, the promising victory of God's goodness, we are going to have to let go of some of the unwanted stuff. We're going to have to leave alone some of the sinful people we cannot fix. We're going to have to forgive some debts we are owed, just like our debts have already been forgiven by God. I wonder if Jesus may have bent down to the ground at this point in his parable and offered this visual depiction of the good news. You can pick this. Or you can pick this. You can end up with a handful of this or a handful of this. You only have two hands. You only have so much time. Which one do you pick? Now please understand that this teaching is not an excuse to do nothing in the face of injustice. We can stop abuse and hold evildoers to account without eradicating them. In other words, we can keep our baptismal vow to strive for justice and peace with God's help. We can also redress wrongs and work for restorative justice without eradicating the wrongdoers. In other words, we can keep our baptismal vow to persevere in resisting evil with God's help. The good news of this parable is that we are not responsible for eradicating evil by ourselves without God's help. We can trust that God sees and knows and cares that goodness will ultimately prosper and flourish with God's help. And we get to participate in the abundance of that harvest. You only have two hands. You only have so much time this is what we get to pick. Last week, we heard the reassuring voice of the Lord through the second song of the prophet Isaiah. God said this, Just as the rain and snow fall from the heavens and water the earth, bringing forth life and giving growth, so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I have purposed and prosper in that for which I have sent it. In other words, 
followers of Jesus like us can relax a little bit about all the weeds. The love of God is in control and nothing is as powerful or effective as that. We are already on the victorious side of goodness with our limited grasp and our limited time we get to pick goodness. The good news of the parable of the weeds may be best summarized in this encouraging benediction found in, from the proposed 1928 draft of the Book of Common Prayer. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the, Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, earth of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, offering the names associated with our thanksgivings and intercessions, either silently or aloud, and then joining the congregational refrain by responding, hear our prayer. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Today we give special thanks for the members of St. Peter's who serve in the medical community, including Anne, Christy, Lisa, Pete, Shannon, Allison, David, Ron, Lucy, Victoria, Deidre, Kathy, Milena, and Megan.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray for healing for Susie, Kirsten, John, Catherine, Sarah, Ruthie, Marty, Rick, Denise, for Anne, Jeannie, Joy, Carol, Dick, Don, Carol, Nancy, Nancy, Dave, and Kay. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. We pray for the repose of the souls of Robert Bauer, brother of Jim Bauer, and Frank Burke, friend of Beck Sullivan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, a lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray in the words our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and all whom you hold dear, this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, we want to recognize and give thanks for St. Peter's Family Endowment and for our trustees who helped manage this endowment. Back in about 2012, 2013, St. Peter's had an endowment fund. It was, it was really just a reserve account for $1,500 set aside to be part of a permanent base one day. Well, in 2013, the vestry approved a comprehensive set of documents to give structure, the kind of structure necessary to grow the endowment, and grow it has. The endowment at St. Peter's is now $180,000 in permanently restricted funds, with an additional $112,000 invested in temporarily restricted building funds. Our trustees manage this nearly $300,000 corpus for the benefit of St. Peter's mission and ministries. Over the years, we receive an annual small grant to be used for mission or education or some building related need. In total, over those years, we've already been blessed as a parish to receive in excess of $7,000 of support from St. Peter's endowment. So today we give thanks for the generosity of the parishioners who have made this possible and for our trustees who continue to manage it.